Hey guys, Rexy here, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about probably the most controversial FNAF fan game of all time. This game is just downright disturbing, and to be honest, most YouTubers won't even touch it with a 12-foot pole. You could call it the Grinch of fan games. And to be honest, the gameplay itself is only partially why it is so horrid. I mean, some people even consider this their favorite FNAF fan game of all time. That is, at least until they figure out the dark, sinister secrets behind the developers of the game. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't guessed it already, we are talking about FNAF Dormitibus. Now, Dormitibus was created by four developers. Own Trick, Steven Mator, Super Arthur Brothers, and Blackout. Now, the game itself was announced on November 2015. It was originally supposed to be a free roam game. However, in 2016, it got reworked into a classical FNAF game, and it was actually released in 2018. The game itself was supposed to serve as a sequel to Five Nights at Freddy's 3, and the idea behind it was pretty cool and got a lot of good responses on Game Jolt. I mean, it definitely took a unique approach to what we would had seen up to this point in FNAF fan games. However, on the other side of the token, there was probably just as many people who hated the game as passionately. Blaming it on the dark story matter behind the game, and of course the villain itself, which was a little bit questionable. And what makes it even crazier is the game actually got remastered 27 days ago, and people still refuse to play it even though times are slow for FNAF right now. And if you think I'm being dramatic, just look at my brother's channel, Daco's channel, and any other big FNAF YouTuber. They refuse to post this game. So why exactly is that? Well, if you make it to the end of this video, you're going to be in for quite the surprise. So let's go ahead and dive in. So what better place to start than the story of this game? So as stated earlier, this takes place right after Five Nights at Freddy's 3 as the entire Fazbear Fright has now been burned down. And apparently you play as a man named John who upon waking up doesn't remember how we got there or why he's here to begin with. Shortly after, however, you get a call by a man named Peter, who reveals that John is dead and he was also the one who burnt this place down to begin with. And to make matters worse, the animatronics in the establishment are now hunting him. But that's not even the weirdest part. Apparently, the animatronics that are hunting him are John's childhood friends, who mysteriously went missing after events tied to Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria. And now that John is dead, his friends are out to get him. Because in the game, there's this thing called plasma, and apparently it's the only way to make it back into the real world if you're dead. So essentially, his friends are trying to find this ghost form of John in order to extract his plasma and make it back into the real world. However, this doesn't always go according to plan. Apparently, one of his friends named Tom actually tried to use some leftover plasma to resurrect some of the missing children. But his plan failed and actually ended up turning his friends into these terrible animatronics. And these animatronics include the Boa, Cake Bear, Golden Call, Havoc Puppet, Havoc Foxy, Havoc Chica, Havoc Freddy, and Molten Evil. Not to mention this horrifying looking thing called the Soul Cage. And somehow John needs to survive 10 nights which ultimately ends up turning into 11 with these horrifying animatronic friends of his. Which the developers wanted this to more or less be a more content filled version of Scott's game and was supposed to run 70 minutes if you didn't die a single time. But to make matters worse, you actually need to find secret tapes that only spawn in on certain levels and... If you don't find all the tapes by the end of the surviving of night 10, then you get a bad ending. Which, you know you get the bad ending if basically you get to night 10 and instead of seeing animatronics anymore, you just see this elongated version of Springtrap. Which, in this game, is actually called Garvey Wright. Who, believe it or not, is actually our protagonist John's brother, but more on that later. Because whether you survive the night or not, you end up dying. And they leave you with this tombstone that just says, John Wright? Born 1969, dies 2017, and you get this wonderful message on there that says, Brat, scum, waste of air. Now, of course, you're probably wondering, how do you get the good ending? 
And the only way to do that is if you survive all of the nights of the game and collect every single one of these hidden tapes. And if done correctly, you actually get access to this cardboard theater, which I think is really unique and pretty enjoyable in my opinion. To be honest, this is my favorite part of the game because it actually reveals what happened and how John got here to begin with. You see, it reveals that John burnt down the pizzeria in order to stop Garvey, who we already know at this point is his brother. It also reveals that at birth, Garvey had a weird birth defect that made his skin pigmentation make him look like he was purple. Does it sound familiar at this point? Hmm, a purple guy also gets into a spring trap suit. Ring any bells, ladies and gentlemen? But it actually has a unique twist when it comes to this game. For one, Garvey was actually bullied for this skin pigmentation by other kids, including his own brother. And a lot of this bullying occurred at a place named Cake Bear's Family Diner, which was owned by their father, Alex Wright. And since their father had so many other things going on with the restaurant, he really never took a moment to step in and stop the bullying. At least until one day where Garvey eventually snapped and he had enough of the bullying. He ended up killing a whole bunch of the children, including their own brother, Peter Wright which, if you'll recall, is the same person who calls John on the very first night. And the bodies were never located, never to be seen again, unfortunately. And Garvey just went on a continuous murder rampage, continuously killing children after children. And this went on for years at different locations, in hopes of crushing the reputation of Cake Bears once and for all. However, after the first series of murders, their father Alex ended up selling the business and it was rebranded into what we now know as Freddy's. But unfortunately, that didn't stop Garvey because he just kept coming back and murdering more children at the same location. But of course, as the year went by, the children's spirits began to haunt Garvey. So his master plan was to come back, destroy the animatronics and free the spirits of the children. But that really backfired on him, as in the last establishment that he tried to free the children, he got backed into the spring trap suit. And we already know how this plays out. Obviously, the spring locks killed his physical body, but his soul was trapped inside the animatronic forever. And once John got wind of this whole thing, he ended up coming back to the establishment and took on the night guard position. So once taking up his new post at Fazbear Frights, he had no other choice but to burn down the building in order to stop his brother. Now, I will say that the game has somewhat of a positive ending because Garvey does get dragged down to the pits of hell to pay for his sins, while John and his brother and of course the other children's spirits are ascended into heaven to live, I guess, happily ever after? Closing out what we know as the story of Dormitibus. Which, to be honest, if you did take the time to figure out all the secret tapes and of course get this true ending, I could see why you would enjoy the game. Thus, the positive reviews that were all over Game Jolt. However, if you did just a casual playthrough and you weren't really trying so hard to get all of these secret tapes, you really wouldn't understand what the heck is going on in the game. I think the gist of it would be that your name is John, your friends are animatronics trying to kill you, and there's some guy named Garvey that wants to attack you in a spring lock suit. So I could definitely see why it got the negative hate, mainly because a lot of people don't want to sit not only through 70 minutes of gameplay without dying for 10 nights, but also looking for secret tapes while getting attacked by multiple animatronics. It just seems like a chaotic mess. But if you think this is bad, let me tell you guys, you haven't heard anything yet. So this is probably the part of the video where I'll tell you, you should probably skip ahead if you don't want to hear anything really disturbing. But I guess if you're still here, I'll try and explain it to the best of my ability. So if you'll recall, I told you that Garvey is really, really similar to William Afton. And that's exactly what the lead writer of the game was going for. See, Blackout wanted this character to be somewhat of a really edgy version of Purple Guy. But the way he went about it was not only creepy, but probably a little too far over the edge. I mean, the weird purple pigmentation thing was enough already. But if you unfortunately found tape number three within the game and listened to it, you'll see just how disgusting this game can be. Oh my god! 
This is most certainly beginning to be... fun. There's this hot 15-year-old that was part of the kids' friends group. Ah. You know, it was fun. She screamed, screamed, but nobody heard her. It was so much fun. She's in one of the suits now. Just a little more time until Fred Bears is going down as well. But hey, I'll find my ways to catch her with the others. I just don't get it. Why would they even add this in the game? It's one thing to make your main antagonist dislike. Like, I get that part. But to make him not only a serial killer, which is bad enough, but a pedophile and a rapist? This is such a distasteful twist to the game that is even more unnecessary than I, I can even imagine. And not only that, it puts a literal dark cloud over the entire game. And if I'm being 100% honest with you, it's just not anything that we need in the FNAF community. And you know what? You would really think that's where it ends, but unfortunately it gets a lot worse. And I'm not even going to read it, but here is the newspaper clipping that is later found in the game, which somehow makes this even more disturbing. And look, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that FNAF is all peaches and roses and everything always goes perfect. I know that children are supposed to die, not only in the fan games, but also in the true lore of the series. I mean, for Pete's sake, we've all seen the trailer of the freaking FNAF movie at this point. But to handle it in such a way? Like, there's parts to this game that literally don't need to go that far. And one thing that you at least have to give the actual FNAF series and the fan games up until this one is that they just leave it up into the viewer's interpretation. Most of our storylines come from 8-bit versions of the game and cutscenes, and William's character is already so compelling that he doesn't need to do these horrid things or we need to know about them. You would say that this Garvey character written by Blackout is literally just put in the game for shock value. And to be honest, I mean, his whole backstory doesn't even make much sense. I mean, he was murdering children at these different like cake bear establishments, but for what? It's not like they were the reason that he was getting bullied as a kid. I mean, I guess you can say it's because of his father not paying much attention to what was going on. But to be honest, this just seems like lazy writing. And it's been proven time and time again, you don't need a villain to do these horrible acts to make people hate him or make him a good villain. If you write your story good enough, you don't need to do all these crazy shock value things. Take Dolores Umbridge, for example. I know it's a kind of random example, but she didn't have to do any of these horrid things to make people hate her. And even William Afton himself is such a good villain. I mean, there's never been any question as to why William does the things he does. He has an established motive and not to mention a storyline that somewhat backs him up. Shoot, I mean, some people might even feel bad for the guy. That's what makes a good villain not doing horrid acts to children under the age of 15. So I guess my question here is what on earth made Blackout think this was a good idea to put in this villain's horror story? Well, ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, it gets a lot worse. You see, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and that is where we come to the story of the writer of Dormitibus himself, Blackout. Which brings me to November 12th, 2020, where Blackout was finally exposed for all of the horrid things that he was doing in Discord messages and so on and so forth. This led to Nocturnum, the team director over at Radiance, coming out with an unlisted video explaining his own personal horror stories with Blackout. He shares a story about how he was harassed by Blackout and his friends just for stupid little things. And then in 2018, a video came out exposing a whole lot more horrifying details. This video described Blackout as a control freak, a nymphomaniac, a transphobe, and not to mention someone who makes light and joked about raping people and enjoying it. And as if things couldn't get any worse, Blackout was also exposed as being a pedophile. Having Discord chats with a 12-year-old and trying to convince them to be his special little friend. 
and tried to validate his weird acts, making jokes about Germany's age of consent laws being really lax. And he even went as far as sending nudes to this same 12 year old. And of course, once his friends got word of this, they all began cutting ties with him, which sent Blackout into this downward spiral of harassing other people for a little bit until he came out with this post, which basically describes how he's going to leave the once known alias of Blackout behind and thanking people for sticking with him throughout all of the drama even leaves an honest goodbye to all and then signs off for the last time. And to make things even weirder, he has a little summary blob underneath his game show profile that says, Jesus Christ, just leave me be. I don't want to live in your heads rent free. I've moved on and you should as well. Bye. And if you ask me, it sounds like somebody who really still doesn't take responsibility for the horrible things that he's done in his past. So what does this mean for Dormitibus? For one, I mean, it seems like the sad truth behind one writer ruining such a great potential game. And it's almost as if he wanted to live out his sick fantasy as the main antagonist of the game. And in the process, ruined something that could have actually been pretty phenomenal in the FNAF community. And for the game itself, well, sadly, like I said at the beginning of the video, no big YouTuber even wants to go near it. With all this dark controversy surrounding a kid's game, it's not really in our best interest. But there was a brand new remastered version of it that came out, like I said, maybe 27 days ago to this point, and it does look promising. And with Blackout having no involvement, it might be something that I would like to check out in the near future. And if it's something that would interest you, do me a big favor and comment that down below. But guys, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this video here. Thank you guys again for all the love and support and watching. And if you enjoy FNAF content just like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. I promise you won't regret it. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Until then, peace out!